Hello everyone. What do neurons and batteries have in common? Let's find out in this resting potential screencast. Your nervous system is the basis for all sensation and action. Everything you think, feel, and do. Some examples are perhaps counterintuitive things like digestion, your decisions, your senses, hearing, touch, sight, smell, taste, your heartbeat, your actions, movements like dance, sports, walking, talking, your thoughts, your emotions, feelings. All of these are a product of the functioning of nerve cells. So what are the cells in our nervous system doing to allow these functions? Let's take a deep dive down to the cellular and molecular levels of action. We begin with the cell at rest and its resting potential for action, which we call the resting potential. This is the state of the neuron prior to any signals are sent between cells. It's what happens before the nerve impulse or the action potential. What is the purpose of this resting potential or the difference in the electrical charge between the inside and the outside of nerve cells, which is just about minus 70 millivolts? Well, the purpose is to be able to send messages between cells to communicate so that you can think, feel, and act. So we see a neuron here, which in this state is said to be polarized. That is, the inside of the neuron here in orange is more negative than the outside of the neuron here in white with the plus signs. So the intracellular environment is more negative than the extracellular environment as shown here by the voltmeter. Why is there this resting potential or this difference in the electrical charge between the inside and the outside of the cell. Well, there's an uneven distribution of positive and negative ions. Positive ions are sodium and potassium, and negative ions are a chloride as well as some other things in the cell like large proteins that are also negatively charged. So that creates this difference in charge. But how? How does that happen? Well, we have two mechanisms. We have the fact that the membrane, which separates the inside and the outside of the cell, is selectively permeable. That is, it's picky about which ions it lets in versus out. This is a passive process that allows both potassium and chloride to pass freely through the cell sodium with some difficulty, and negative charged proteins, not at all. So that's the selective membrane permeability. There's another mechanism, which is an active one, and that's the sodium-potassium pump. Here, the sodium-potassium pump is a protein complex that pumps out three sodium ions out for every two potassium in. So by doing this, it maintains this resting equilibrium, or really disequilibrium. There's mi about a million of these pumps in a single neuron. So let's zoom in to the cell and see what's going on inside and outside of it. This figure is one of the most important ones in this lesson about neural communication. So be sure to really take the time to understand it. Let's look at all its components. The cell membrane here, or plasma membrane shown in gray, separates the inside of the cell, shown here in yellow, from the extracellular environment shown here in blue, greenish. On the outside of the cell, we have lots of sodium ions shown here in blue. There's also a few potassium ions shown in green. On the inside of the cell, we see lots of potassium ions in green and few to none sodium ions. 
here in blue. There's also these huge negatively charged proteins um, in purple, which are largely responsible for this negative minus 70 millivolt uh, resting potential. So on the membrane, we also have a few other components, and these are sodium channels, as you see here in pink. This one is, are closed at rest. So as you see here from this arrow, if sodium tries to get in, it will bounce back. It cannot come inside the cell. There's also a potassium channel uh, here in blue-green. And this one um, is partially closed, allowing the slow passage of potassium, as you see here in this red arrow. So these are called leak channels, sodium and potassium channels. Finally, we have uh, this very important mechanism that we already talked about, or component, the sodium-potassium pump. The pump maintains this resting equilibrium, pumping out three sodium ions for every two potassium in. And this goes against the concentration gradients of both sodium and potassium, as I will explain shortly. Meaning that sodium really wants to come in because there's way more of it outside than on the inside. So its concentration gradient is pushing it in, but the pump is saying, uh-uh, no, I'm going to pump you out. Whereas for potassium, uh, its concentration gradient is really pushing it out because there's so much more potassium on the inside than on the outside. But the, the sodium-potassium pump is saying, uh-uh, I'm going to push you in. So the sodium works against the concentration gradients of both sodium and potassium. Fun fact, the sodium-potassium pump uses up a great deal of energy, about 40% of the body's energy, and the estimates are even higher for the brain, mostly in the form of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, an organic compound that is the primary source of energy for bodily functions. If the pump does not function properly in brain cells, the result is severe neurological conditions, such as migraines with aura, uh, muscle spasms, or unilateral paralysis like hemiplegia. So, therefore, due to the selective membrane permeability at rest, we have two gradients or differences across the membrane. The electrical gradient or electrostatic gradient, the difference in charge across a membrane, think of it as like charges repel, opposites attract, like magnets. And the concentration gradient, which is a chemical gradient, the difference in solute concentrations across a membrane. Um, and this causes the flow from high to low concentration. Think of dropping a spoonful of sugar in water or ink in water. It's going to dissolve and go from areas of high to low concentration, right? And then even itself out, homogenizing itself. These gradients relate to the permeability of the membrane. You can think of it as a door bouncer, limiting the circulation of people in and out of a party or club. Potassium and chloride pass freely. Sodium with some difficulty and large negatively charged proteins, not at all. Therefore, potassium's concentration gradient pushes it out of the cell. There's too much of it inside. Its electrostatic gradient pushes it in because the inside is negatively charged and potassium is positive. So uh, like charges uh, repel, whereas opposites attract. For sodium, both its concentration and electrostatic gradients push it in. It's positive, the inside is negative, so opposites attract. It's positive, the inside of the cell is negative, so the concentration, I'm sorry, there's more of it outside than more of it inside than there is of it inside. So sodium's concentration gradient is going to push it in as well. So both concentration and electrostatic gradients of sodium push it in. And this is really important because this means that sodium will come rushing into the cell during an actual signal or an action potential, as we will see later. Another fun, if, like, if slightly grim fact, 
death by lethal injection uses potassium chloride, which causes a tenfold increase in extracellular concentration of potassium. This wipes out the resting potential because it reverses potassium's concentration gradient. Now there's more of it on the outside rather than on the inside of the cell and thus pushes potassium into the cell rather than out of the cell. This results in depolarization of the neuron to minus 17 millivolts with the inside of the cell becoming more positive, thus rendering excitable cells such as cardiac muscle unable to generate impulses required for contraction and ultimately leading to cardiac arrest. You may have to listen to this explanation a couple of times to really get it. <clears throat> so, what do neurons and batteries have in common? They both store energy that is eventually released. Think of a dam that you may have observed. This is essentially a huge wall that keeps the force of downstream water contained. Now open the floodgates. Hydroelectric power is produced as water passes through the dam into the river below. Electricity is produced by a device called a turbine that captures and converts the released energy. A battery works similarly by separating its positive and negative nodes or terminals, which are made of different chemicals, thus preventing the flow of ions or electrons until the battery is hooked up to a device like a light bulb or electrical circuit and energy is released and allowed to flow. So there you go. Resting potentials, neurons, batteries, all wrapped up into a unified framework. The next step is to learn about the actual release of energy, the nerve signal or action potential in future screencasts and lectures. For this lecture and at the end of the screencast, you should be able to explain the concept of a resting potential, including electrical and concentration gradients, and evaluate the role of selective membrane permeability and the sodium potassium pump in maintaining the resting potential. Apply the stuff to your life and yourself. See you next time.